Tyler and Sarah Prince with us today, um, graduates of Boston Baptist College and newly approved missionaries uh, just in May. They were approved and already up to 40% in their uh, support raised, which is astounding. And um, Tyler was a member of our sister church over in um, Berica, Bay State Baptist, and um, our friend Brian Spicer over there. And so when I learned that uh, they were going to the mission field, uh, I was excited to have them come in. Uh, they are, I can announce this, right, they are expecting their first baby, a boy, um, in, the, in the near future, and that's exciting for them. And so um, I've asked Tyler to preach to us this morning. So Tyler, come on up. Give us what God's laid on your heart. Well, thank you so much for having us. We're very, I'm just uh, elated to be here. This is just uh, an awesome opportunity. You know, you hear stories growing up at Bay State of just people at Heritage and just how awesome you guys are. And so I just really am very thankful that you've had us here this morning. Um, like you said, we, are, we started our deputation trail in May, and we're just about to, we're just about to hit 40% funded. Hopefully by the time we get back to Kansas at the beginning of January, we'll be at 40%. And uh, so we're going to Ireland, and uh, Ireland is a tough field. It is a difficult field to go in because of uh, just there's a lot of factors. Irish people, uh, you know, we, we're, we're close to Boston here where it's just like all Irish people. They're just kind of closed off to a lot of things that the outsiders have to say. And basically that just means they don't like to, in Ireland at least, they don't like to talk to Americans. Uh, and so I'm going to, th- you know, I want to give you a little bit of my testimony uh, and just kind of where we came from and how God called Sarah and I to Ireland. Um, and then we'll get into uh, the scripture this morning. If you want to open your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew this morning. We're going to start in chapter 4. But, you know, our plans, like the video said, for Ireland is that, uh, you know, we really kind of went through this rough process of finding out what God wanted us to do uh, through going to or, or, or learning about Ireland. You know, the very first thing we learned is that Ireland's the least evangelized English-speaking country in the entire world. And so really, like, there's a lot of, like, words in that sentence. Basically what that means is, is people that, that would attend a Bible-believing, um, you know, repent, be baptized, all that stuff, a Bible-believing church. It's only about 3.6, 3.4%. It's gone down since I made the video, actually. Um, 3.4% of the people that uh, would go to church are attending a church like that. And so um, we, uh, you know, when we, when, we, when we learned that, it was just something that floored me because when you think of Ireland, you think, well, it's a Christian nation. Um, and, you know, when we talk to people, a lot of the, we got to go over there uh, last September and we did three weeks uh, in Ireland with the people there that, that we're going to go work with. And we did like street evangelism and we went on to, we talked to people. And when somebody in Ireland, kind of like here, when they say they're Catholic, well, they don't, that doesn't mean they go to a Catholic church. And that doesn't mean that, that they attend any church at all. It's really Catholic by association. Um, and, and so a lot of it's like uh, just a label for them. And we saw a huge need for people to just get inside of a church and learn about the gospel. Uh, and so that, that really uh, uh, floored us big time. And, you know, if you said that to somebody a couple hundred years ago, that, that the people in Ireland don't really care to go to church and, and fellowship with one another and, and share the gospel, I mean, they would have laughed in your face because Ireland has a very rich history of Christianity. And, and of, they had monks in Ireland that would devote their entire lives living on the West Coast, uh, out in the little islands on the ocean in these little beehive huts. And they would transcribe the scriptures and they were devoted to Christ and the gospel. And that's somehow gotten lost over the years. It was a hub of Christianity. People were devoting their lives to Christ over there. And so really, it's genuinely a very dark spiritual place over there. You know, the spiritual health of people in Ireland is just sad. It's, it's really, really sad. It's dark. I mean, it ra- it's literally dark because it, it rains every single day because of the geography of Ireland. 
where it is and the way the jet streams work and the way that storms come up the west coast of Europe, I mean, they get hit with just rain every single day and it's dark and people are depressed and their suicide rate is so much higher than it needs to be because, you know, if you visit Ireland for a few weeks, you're going to sit there and be like, how in the world are people so sad around here? Because this place is beautiful and it is. And God has made a beautiful land over there. But, and like we said in the video, it's a melting pot of culture. Um, their borders used to be, not anymore, but they were wide open to immigrants from all over the place. Um, and, and so those people, I'll say, are, are, they're easy to reach because they're displaced and they're looking for something. I wouldn't say easy, but you know, it's a, it's a lot easier than reaching the Irish people. And that's Sarah and I's passion, is to go over there and reach the Irish people because they're so closed off. I think God put that in front of me because I love a good challenge. Uh, and you'll hear that in my testimony. I love a good challenge, and I love facing adversity. Uh, and so, you know, I think that God's really put that on our heart to reach the Irish people. Um, and, you know, whatever comes out of that, whatever fruit comes out of that, if we just reach immigrants, that's fine too, because no matter who we reach, we're reaching it for the, for the good news of Christ. And that's another soul going to heaven, and we don't care the nationality, and neither does, neither does Scripture. It does not care about nationality at all. Uh, but that's just our passion. Um, and so we're going to go over there and we're going to probably formulate a strategy. We're going to work under those two, under that couple, Josh and Denise, for about a year. Uh, and then after that, we're going to assess our team. We're still going to work under the same team with them. And we will figure out if we want to go plant another church somewhere else on the island or if they want to go plant another church and we'll take over the church there. And like I said, you know, whatever fruit comes out of that, we will gladly welcome because uh, the gospel is just worth it for everyone. Um, and, and so just a little bit of uh, background about myself. I personally, I grew up in North Reading, Massachusetts. Um, so I'm, I'm a local kid to here. And uh, when we didn't grow up in a Christian home, much like the, uh, the, the people in Ireland. If you had asked me when I was a kid, you know, are you, are you religious? I would, I would have told you I was Catholic, but I'd, I'd never been to church in my entire life. And so uh, I, I didn't know anything about the Bible. I, ha I had no idea. Um, I was kind of somebody who was, I was like a floater. You know, in school, I didn't feel like I fit in anywhere. Um, I just, whoever was like the group that accepted me was the group I went with. And, you know, I could fit in with anybody. I just kind of found myself being a real people pleaser back then. And I could just be anybody. And so out of that, when, uh, you know, you get to, to early high school and, and middle school age, I, uh, my friends, who I really... Uh, at the time were just like my own, there was like the only thing that brought me joy was hanging out with my friends. You know, they get into like drugs and drinking and, and doing all this stuff. And so that's just the crowd that I followed. And I lived for the world as much as somebody lives for the world. I was in a punk rock band. We travel all over New England. Uh, I couldn't care less about school. Um, I was a horrible, I never did homework or anything. I was failing all my classes. I was on drugs. I was drinking. I was just doing everything I possibly could to ruin my future. And, uh, you know, just living for the world. And um, I have one older brother. And he, he ends up starting, he dates this girl. They went to high school together. And they start dating. And uh, he goes to church with her. Because my brother was like the golden child. And I was like the, the not golden child. And so... <laughs> He, uh, it only makes sense that he ended up in church, but he, uh, he, he started going with this girl, and they fell in love, and they started dating, and he goes to church with her, and he gets saved, and he accepts Christ, and he gets baptized, but he didn't tell us. He didn't tell me or my, me, my mom, or my dad, and so my mother finds out that he got baptized uh, through a Facebook post, and uh, so she's like, oh no, my son joined a cult. One of my, because this was foreign to us, like, you know, making a decision for, for the Lord and your old, like, you just didn't do that. And, uh, and so she thought he joined a cult. And so she's like, well, I got, I really, I have to go figure this out. I have to go see what this is all about, just to make sure it's not like the drink the Kool-Aid kind of cult. And so they, uh, she went and she loved it. Um, this was Bay State. Um, and she loved it. And she heard Brian, Brian Spicer speak and, and heard somebody actually rightly divide the word of God. And she was just like floored by it. And so she, she kept going. And I was like, oh, so now my brother and my mom joined a cult. And I was, I was, so, I was so insanely against them going to church. Because like in the culture that I was in, that punk rock, like anarchy kind of culture, church was like, you didn't do that. Like you don't do that because that's weird. And they're just trying to brainwash you and, and all this stuff. And so I had all my preconceived notions about what church was. And uh, they would not stop inviting me to church. 
and, and my dad. And, and we were both just like, no, we're not, we're not doing that. No, thank you. And uh, I was like kind of combative about it. Uh, just please stop asking me. And there was just one random morning. It was October 2009. I'm 16 years old. Um, and my mom comes upstairs. She wakes me up out of this like drunken stupor that I was in. And she's like, why don't you come to, why don't you come to church with me this morning? I was like, oh my goodness, you woke me up to ask me to go to church. No, I'm not going. And then she kept asking and kept asking, and I was like, you know what, fine. I will go because if I go this one time, she'll stop asking me. And so I went, and I'll be honest. I'm honest with every church I go to. I did not like it. I did not like it at all because everybody was so nice, and I just like wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't into that like at all. And so uh, I went, and I thought the music was corny, and it was just like, I, I was just so insanely against it. Uh, but the one thing that kept me going wasn't just that the people, the, the people were nice, but they, they, they loved on me, regardless of who I was. And, I, and a lot of them uh, definitely knew the kind of lifestyle that I was into, and they didn't care about that. And, and they genuinely showed the love of Jesus to me. And that was something that I found addicting because, like I said, I was a floater. I, was, I felt like I needed to do certain things to fit in. Uh, I needed to be, you know, on drugs and drinking with my friends to be able, for them to be able to accept me. And then I go to this place and they're like, no, we love you no matter what you do. We don't care what you do. We love you. And so I found that to be uh, really addicting. And I liked all the kids my age. Um, they, were, they were great and they were really nice to me. And so I started going to their youth group. I wasn't going like every single week, but I was like off and on because I would go, I, I would leave the church and I'm like, man, why do I like that so much? It's, I shouldn't like that so much. That's weird. And so I started going to the youth group and then I found myself going every single Sunday. Uh, and then, so that was October of 2009, fast forward to July of 2010, we're about to go to camp and you're like, all my friends are making fun of me because I'm going to overnight church camp. And, you know, I've been learning about the Bible. I've been telling them about it and like how cool I think that, that Jesus was for loving people re just regardless of who they were. I just loved that. And they would just always make fun of me. And uh, in July of 2010, we were at camp and uh, this guy named Sean Sears, pastor down in Avon, Mass. He was, uh, we were up at Bible, uh, or Monadnock Bible Camp. And uh, in that room on a Thursday night, it was the same exact, maybe not the same week, but the same year that my wife was at her camp because she's a pastor's kid. She grew up in a pastor's home. She was at camp and she dedicated her life to the missions field that same exact year. Uh, July 2010, on a Thursday night, I got saved. I accepted Christ as my Savior. Um, I got baptized very shortly after that. Um, and then, you know, I just, I joined the band and I played the drums in the band. I, uh, it, it, my sanctification process, man, I, I'd love to stand here and tell you that I was like free of all my addictions right away. Uh, that's not the case, but I do stand here now. I don't do any of that stuff I used to do, which is probably a good thing because I'm a missionary now, but you know, uh, you know, eventually God does, God, God, God works on people in his timing. Um, and, you know, sometimes I do believe that my sin got in the way of that, but God did not forsake me, and he never left me. Um, and I think that that's important for us to realize. Uh, something that I see in my story and throughout Scripture is that, you know, I have to be honest with you guys. Like I said, I'm honest with every church that I go to, is that I don't feel qualified to be a missionary. I do not feel qualified I don't feel qualified to go to Ireland. I don't come from, like I said, I don't come from a Christian background. I, dropped, I ended up dropping out of high school very shortly after I got saved because I was so far behind. I think in four years of high school, I passed four classes. Failed every single one of them, or almost all of them. And so I had to drop out. I had a real, you know, I didn't have the highest GPA in college when I finally did go to college. You know, I'm somebody who fails time and time again, and I really do fail to meet my own expectations of what a missionary should be. Because the missionaries that I've interacted with over the years, right, they're clean cut. Uh, they don't have any tattoos. Uh, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're soft-spoken, real good communicators, right? They definitely don't have a slice of pizza tattooed on their middle finger. Uh, <laughs> I'm still unsure to this day why God chose me to be a missionary, why God chose me for the mission, for the mission field, but, but he did. Okay, let's get that straight. He did, despite me being unqualified. And I really do think that, that often, 
We, we really doubt what we're capable of doing through Christ and what God has called us to do because we feel unqualified for it. And I want to, I want to tell you this morning, let's put us all in that same group of unqualified. I want to tell you, we are unqualified. We, we are not qualified. We do not have much to offer, if anything. Uh, but through Christ, we are able to be found fully equipped to serve God in exactly what he wants us to do. Oh, whoa, wait a second. He can't say that. I've got so much to offer. I'm good at this. I'm good at that. Great. We're still all in this area of unqualified to serve God on our own strength. Don't worry. I want to share with you somebody else who was totally, totally unqualified to serve the Lord, but he ended up doing amazing things. Uh, Throughout Scripture, we have examples of men and women doing something amazing for God, and they had no business doing it. No business. Moses, right? Moses, does anybody know, shout it out if you know it. What was Moses' big, like, problem? Speech? What else? He stuttered, but what else? What did he do? what's What's a big sin that he committed? He literally murdered somebody. Miriam was a gossip. John Mark was rejected by Paul. What was David's big mess up? Murder and adultery. That's two big ones. Solomon was filthy rich. Gideon and Thomas, they were doubters. Elijah was suicidal. Martha was worried. Noah got drunk. Jeremiah was way too young. Abraham was way too old. Peter was terrified of death. Lazarus, uh, Lazarus was literally dead. (laughs) But God used every single one of those people to do amazing, mighty things for him. Well, if they did all these crazy things and they messed up, well, then they're unqualified too. Well, look at that. We're all unqualified. And so I want to tell you this morning that we are not qualified in our own strength, but it is Christ who is qualified. And through that, we can do exactly what God has called us to do because he's called us to do it. Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 20. That's where we're going to start off this morning. We're going to talk about Peter because Peter did crazy things and Peter also did some pretty stupid stuff. Um, and so, all right, starting in verse 18, now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. And they followed him. So we've heard the story of Peter countless times in church, right? But I want to look at really exactly where he came from and then what he accomplished. Where did he come from and what did he accomplish, right? So first off, he's a fisherman. Fishermen of that time, they were like gruff, unkempt. Uh, They were vile, shabbily dressed. They used vulgar language. The fishermen of that first century, man, they were like a man's man, right? They'd be like a modern day construction worker or an alignment or or an iron worker. And, And genuinely, I think if we could have met Peter before he met Christ, we probably would have avoided him, right? Fishermen did not probably didn't smell good. They still don't. But Peter was, he's, he's a man of many, he's a man, man of many strengths, but he's also a man of many weaknesses. Jesus still approached Peter and his brother despite their looks, their status, or their wealth. I think a lot of the times in the 21st century, we see these like uh, adaptations of the New Testament on TV. I don't think it does it that good of justice because, I mean, Peter and these people in these first century, just uh, legitimately like low lives, that, that Jesus chose to be his 12 disciples, I mean, they were like dirty, poor people. Uh, and, and oftentimes they're seen maybe just like kind of, kind of messed up and kind of shabbily dressed and kind of, you know, they, these guys were like the low of the low in the first century. And so Jesus, first thing I see out of that is that, that Jesus, he's going to approach anybody at any time that he feels fit, right? There's no need to gather your stuff before you come and follow Christ. What did they do and there in Matthew chapter 4? They immediately, they left their nets and they followed him. We don't have to have it all together. I certainly didn't have it all together. I think that we often think that we have to do, we have to do X, Y, Z. We have to do this. I have to stop doing this in order for me to follow the Lord. Right? That's not the case. Follow the Lord exactly where you're at and let him work on you. Let him work on you. You don't have to fix your life. Christ will fix your life. I remember one time I was in youth group. A few months after I started going to church, I was in youth group. Um, Before I was saved, my youth pastor, Tim Chase, uh, he took me into his office, and he sits me down, and he's like, Tyler, you've been learning a lot about the Bible. 
Uh, you've been answering questions. You're really understanding this stuff. And for me, that was like weird because I was so bad at school. And he was like, do you want to know what being saved is? And I was like, well, yeah, what is that? And so he brings me down the Romans road and he leads me, and he shows me what Jesus did for me on the cross and the actual spiritual, the, the spiritual aspect of salvation. Uh, and he looks at me, and it was this beautiful moment between my youth pastor and I. I remember it to this day very vividly. It was awesome. He presented the gospel to me in such a clear way. And he looks at me, and he says, Tyler, do you want to do that right now? Do you want to be saved? And I said, well, can I ask my mom first? <laughs> I was scared. I didn't know. I didn't. Gen, I genuinely didn't know what I was about to do. I had no idea what I was supposed to do, and I thought at least, at the very least, maybe I should clean up my language first. Maybe I should quit being in this punk rock band first. Maybe I should stop smoking first. Don't wait for the right timing, right? Because when when God calls you to do something, when Christ is before you, there's no better time than literally right then and there to repent and follow Christ, right? We're not promised tomorrow, and I don't say that to scare people. I say that because it's a genuine reality that at the blink of an eye, we could be looking at eternity. Don't put it off. Jesus approached Peter at his dirtiest, right? He was a, he was a smelly, sweaty fisherman, and Jesus just said, hey, get up and follow me, and they immediately dropped their nets and followed him. They didn't bathe first. They didn't work on their personalities first. They didn't clean up their language first. They simply acted on the call to follow Christ, What's the number one prerequisite? What do you have to be in order to be saved? You have to be lost. You have to be a sinner. That's the only thing you need to be able to do in order to be saved. I think we're all pretty good at being sinners, I'll be honest, right? It comes very natural to us. That's the only thing you need to be in order to be saved. You need to be savable. So what is that? What, is, what even is being saved? What does that mean? Turn to Matthew chapter 16. Jesus, in this passage, he's having a conversation with his disciples about his identity. Starting in verse 13. Now, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking the disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Right? He's saying, who, do, who are people, to, what are they saying about me? And they said, some say John the Baptist. John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or just one of the other prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Who do you yourselves say that I am? And Simon Peter, the main character of this uh, this here sermon, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That was his answer. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. When Peter correctly identified who Jesus was, look look how Jesus identifies Peter. How does he respond? Verse 17, he said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjana, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Right, so really what changed in that moment wasn't the chemical compound that makes up Peter, right? Peter was still Peter. But really it's how Peter's viewing himself now. Jesus correctly identifies Peter when Peter correctly identifies Jesus. He said he's the rock, and suddenly Peter could see the man that he was meant to be. This, and so when we talk about, when we, when we, uh, when we talk about this, this, uh, this passage between, or this conversation between Peter and Jesus, right, this confession is what we call the thing that saves us, right? This is the, the confession that Jesus is the Son of God, the Lamb of God. And so really... Who do you say Jesus is? If somebody came up to you and said, who is Jesus? Like, you go to church, you're in here now, and somebody would say, why did you go to church? Who is Jesus? What's your answer? Really, it's life's biggest question. Knowing God, it's paramount to finding out why he made you and what he made you to do. And so realizing who Christ is, suddenly, Peter is qualified. And it's not anything that he had to offer, but it was through the confession that he made in Christ. He realized that it's not his own strength that he relies on, but Jesus's. And so I want you to do me a favor. Stop talking about who you're not and what you can't do and start listening to what God says about you. You don't need to label yourself. You need to let God do whatever he wants in, through, and with you. 
I think it's time to take Jesus into account when you talk about yourself. I think it's time to take Jesus into account when we speak to other people. All right, backtrack a little bit, Matthew, Matthew chapter 14. After a long, long day of preaching and teaching, Jesus tells, uh, he, so he just feeds the 5,000 men and their families, so well over 5,000 people. Uh, he gives his disciple, disciples some instructions. Verse 22 of Matthew chapter 14, immediately afterwards, so this is right after that event, he compelled the disciples to get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side. And while he sent, or while he sent the crowds away. And so after he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone, but the boat was already a long distance from land. It was battered by the wave, for the wind was contrary. There's a bad storm happening right now. And so in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him, they cried out in fear. Or, I'm sorry, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter responded and said to him, Lord, so this is where our main character here does some kind of funky things. Lord, if that's actually you, I mean, genuinely, who else would it have been? I don't understand why he says that. But Peter says, If that's actually you, let me come out into the water and, or walk on the water with you. And Jesus said, all right, come on out here. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and he began to sink. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out with his hand and took hold of him. And he said to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind stopped, and those who were in the boat worshipped and saying, you truly are the Son of God. Now, just a side note here. I find this hilarious. Jesus just fed 5,000 men and their families with two lo two, uh, 12 loaves, whatever it was. Yeah, thank you. I don't know why I forgot that. Numbers. Five loaves of bread, two fish. 5,000 people and their families. Uh, and then... It took the disciples to see him walking on water and calming the storm to say, you truly are the Son of God. He's done so much at this point. And then this was the one thing. I don't, I don't understand that. Anyways, right here in this passage with Peter, I think we have a perfect, a very perfect example of what it's like to follow Christ. Right? So Jesus, he's walking on the water. The disciples, they're freaking out because they think it's a ghost. And then we have Peter. He says, if that's really you, let me come out with it. So the, this is a huge storm on the Sea of Galilee. The way that the wind comes sweeping down the mountains and across the Sea of Galilee. I mean, these storms were actually pretty violent. And then they're not, in like, they're not on like a cruise liner. They're in this little tiny dinghy boat, maybe with a sail or paddles. Like little tiny boat. There's probably all 12 of them are in there. Uh, and so they're packed in there. And this storm, they're like genuinely, if Jesus isn't, directing their lives and in charge of everything they do, uh, they probably might have died on the, on, uh, during this storm. And so uh, Peter says, if that's really you, let me come out there and also walk in the water. Jesus is like, sure, come on out here. And so in a moment of pure faith, a moment of pure faith, Peter steps out of the boat and he begins to walk on water. His eyes are fixed on the Lord. His concentration is solely on Christ. Nothing is going to stop Peter. And then all of a sudden, he, he notices the storm around him. He breaks his concentration. The waves are crashing and he begins to sink. And I think that when we, when we begin this relationship with the Lord and we get saved, uh, just like I remember, if, oh man, that's been a long time ago now that I got saved. I feel old now that I just thought about that. Anyways, when we get saved, man, we have this passion. We want, we want to tell people about Jesus. And then your friend comes up to you and says, please stop talking about Jesus. I don't care what you have to say. And then you get a little sad about it. We let life happen. We break our concentration that we once had. We begin to sink. We let life get in the way. We mess up. We have this little faith that Jesus talks about. And Jesus, so, so let me ask you a question. Does Jesus let Peter just drown and die? No. He reaches down and he picks him up out of the water. When we fail in our walk with Jesus, I really want you to know that it does not unqualify you. Why does it not unqualify you? Because you were unqualified already. You didn't do anything in the first place to earn this salvation. 
You cannot unqualify yourself because you were not qualified. It's not our own strength that we rely on when we follow Jesus. It's not at all our own strength. It's Christ's strength. And I think that Philippians 4.13 gives us a great example in this whole chapter, right? Let's look at this in context. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Now, let me ask you a question. I call this a refrigerator magnet verse. Uh, This is one of those verses in the Bible that, like, these big Christian companies, they'll rip it out of context, throw it on, like, a, a painting or a magnet, and then, boom, on your refrigerator. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So does that verse mean that after service today, I can, I, I can go and spend all the money that we've raised on deputation, go to the casino, and win a million dollars through Christ who gives me strength? Well, no, I, I would never do that. I, maybe I shouldn't use myself as an example, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Does it mean that I can go skydive off the tallest building in Boston without a parachute, hit the ground, and survive through Christ who gives me strength? Not at all. It means that every single thing that we need to serve God is found in the person and power of Christ. Peter was unqualified, but he found himself with that confession, right? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, right? And in that, Christ qualifies him through, through himself. Look at the amazing things that Peter did through Christ. Has everybody heard of the day of Pentecost before? Right? Huge day. 3,000 people got saved that day. Who was the speaker? It was Peter. We find in Acts that he had amazing conversations with high governing officials of the Roman Roman government. He was able to give the gospel to some of the people in the Roman government. He healed people. He did many things through the Holy Spirit. He was entrusted with bringing the gospel to the people in Rome, where he would ultimately meet his demise But through the strength of Christ, Peter went from that dirty, poor, smelly fisherman to a bold preacher of the gospel. I am unqualified to be a missionary on my own strength. But through Christ and through that confession, I am found qualified, not on anything that I did, but only through Christ. And so if we're all in that, I like to call it the arena of unqualified, I think we need to put our trust and faith in the Lord Jesus and let Him do what He wants with us. Right? Take that step. Offer your time and your resources to the Lord. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to disappoint you. God disappoints you and leaves you. Well, you're the first person in history that's ever happened to. It won't happen. God will not disappoint Don't miss out on the opportunities that God has for you to serve other people and this church because you think you don't have it all together or that you think you do have it all together. So what do we do with Christ's strength? We can live no matter the circumstances. We can serve God no matter what state we're in. How does this punk kid from New England end up having a passion for ministry in Ireland? It's not at all on anything that I've done wrong or right. It's all through Christ who's given me strength. So I think it's time that, that, that you, if you've been down on yourself, or if you've been above, or whatever, in, in, in any season that you're in, let Christ do what He wants through you. And if you've never taken that step, I do ask that you would at least consider it this morning. At least consider it. And I ask also that you'd pray for Sarah and I as we Go and take this same exact kind of message to the people in Ireland because I do believe they need to hear it. I don't know if you've watched the news and studied your Bible lately, but Jesus is coming back. And it'll be a glorious day when Jesus comes back for us. But man, I do not want want to let anybody that I know and I interact with, at least, I I don't want Jesus to be the best kept secret I ever had. We don't want Jesus to be the best kept secret. It's the gospel. Spread it. Let God do what he wants with you. Thank you. To go to the cross, pay the penalty for our sins, take upon himself what we deserve as the unqualified, right? And, uh, and did that so that we can have everlasting life. and We can have abundant life here, everlasting life there, a relationship with the Father that was broken by sin, 
Christ did all of that and so much more. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me. And uh, Tyler, I'm going to ask you and Sarah to head out to where your table is so our folks can greet you. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I wonder today if God spoke to your heart about receiving Christ as your personal Savior. Um, that's a real need. Hey, Mike. Mike Bourne. Can you ask them to... <laughs> Thank you. That's what we're celebrating this year. Jesus coming to the earth so that we could have that salvation, that everlasting life. And so I wonder if you want to ask Christ into your life today. If you've never prayed and asked him to save you. I'm going to word a prayer like I normally do and just ask you to pray it silently. And uh, God will know. He hears your thoughts and he hears your heart. And why not pray this prayer? Lord God, thank you. Thank you for Christmas. Thank you for sending your son. Thank you that Jesus came with me on his mind and on his heart. And thank you for the cross that he bore so that I could be forgiven. Lord Jesus, come into my life and save me. I want to trust you. And you alone, not my good works, not my religious background, just you. And I thank you for keeping your promise that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Christian, I think we were all challenged from uh, Tyler's message today about just lovingly and boldly proclaiming Christ to a world, as the song said, that's been torn all apart. And, and that's all around us. People need Jesus. I heard somebody yesterday on the radio, a DJ on the Christian radio station, challenge her listeners and said, invite three people to Christmas Eve service this year. I've already done that. I, I said, yeah, that's a good idea. I, I'll invite three people that I know. I'm going to say, do the same thing. And be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks a reason of the hope that's within you. Perhaps today you need to pray and ask God for the strength, the, the power, the wisdom, the open doors to tell others about Jesus. He said, you know, and I'm, I'm not going to preach. I'm just going to get to a prayer right here in, in a second. But think about Tyler and Sarah going to a place where, where you know it's going to be tough for them to share the gospel because so many people think they know Jesus and know about Jesus. And you know people like that too. Father, I pray that you would help us, not just at Christmas time, but every day, all year round, for the rest of our lives, for the rest of the time you give us here. Please give us the opportunities to share Christ with people, to explain the gospel, to, to give them gospel tracts. And Lord God, we're, we're praying that you move in a powerful way. Uh, we need revival in our land. Uh, Lord, but most importantly, we just want to see more people come to know Christ as their Savior so that when the day comes that, that we're called home, uh, we've got some folks coming with us. I pray that you'd help us reach our family members. I pray that you'd help us reach our neighbors, our co-workers, our fellow students, whatever it is, whoever it is, wherever they are, help us to be conscious of the fact that people need the Lord. And we thank you as we get ready to celebrate Christmas. We thank you as we rejoice in your calling, Tyler and Sarah, uh, to Ireland and, and the work that you have for them. We thank you for all that you've done for us and what you are going to do, not only for us, but through us, for the cause of Christ. And I pray it in his name. Amen.